Hello everyone, good day. So welcome to our second lecture for meteorology class. Uh, this is our second topic, which is the warming of the earth and the atmosphere. So last week, the week one or the first topic, we discussed about uh, focusing on the earth atmosphere. And now we're going to find out all about warming of the earth and the atmosphere. And for the outline, we have different subtopics. First uh, is we're going to find out why the Earth has seasons. And also, we're going to check uh, the energy, temperature, and heat, and also the mechanisms of heat transfer, as well as what happens to the Earth in coming solar radiation. And then uh, this, we're going to tackle the greenhouse effect, as what I've mentioned uh, in a previous lecture, that we're going to know more about greenhouse effect in this uh, topic. And so we're going to talk about the Earth's energy budget also, the annual energy budget of the Earth. And so what can you see in these pictures? What do you observe? These are four different pictures, photographs showing the different seasons of the Earth. First, in the left side is the winter, next to it is the spring, and then next is summer, and lastly the fall or uh, the autumn. And why do we have the seasons? That is the big question. So we all know before that weather is the state of the atmosphere at a given place and in a given time. And this weather, this state of the atmosphere, is the result of the interactions of solar radiation with Earth's atmosphere and its land sea surface. When you say the interaction of solar radiation with the Earth, that means we need to understand the relationship of the Earth and the sun. This is the basic to understand why the earth has seasons. And as what you can see in this picture, it is showing the earth's slightly elliptical orbit around the sun. And we're going to go back to the terms rotation, revolution, orbit, aphelion, and perihelion. Rotation as that we know it is as the act of rotating of the Earth along its axis, and the revolution, it's the motion of the Earth along its orbit around the Sun. And now, orbit is the path that the Earth is traversing in order to revolve around the Sun. And this orbit is slightly elliptical, as what you can see if you examine closely the figure. And this is the reason why the Earth is a little bit further from the Sun during July in the left side when you compare in January in the right side. The point where the Earth is farthest from the Sun every July of the year is called Apelion, and the point where the Earth is closest to the Sun every January of each year is called Perihelion. Although Earth is closest to the Sun and receives up to 7% more energy each January of the year than in July, this difference plays only a minor role in producing seasonal temperature variations. This is as shown in the fact that, as evidence, the, that during the time where the Earth is closest to the Sun, this is when the Northern Hemisphere winter happens. And so we're going to find out what really plays a big role for the seasonal temperature variations. So apparently, changes in the angle of the sun's rays cause variations in the amount of solar energy that reaches Earth's surface. And in this figure, 
it shows the globe and it illustrates the amount of atmosphere sunlight must traverse before reaching the Earth's surface. It affects the intensity. So in this uh, picture from uh, the equator, which is a zero degree latitude, uh, the sun, the sun rays are uh, striking at 90 degree angle. And above the equator, which is the 30 degree north latitude, the sun rays uh, strike at 60 degree angle. And above it, which is the 60 degree north latitude, the sun is only striking 30 degrees. Because that means the rays striking Earth at low angle near the poles, up, like up until the north, must traverse more of the atmosphere than the rays striking at the high angle around the equator. And these rays that strike at the low angle or near the poles or towards the north part, they are greater uh, they are greater subject for depletion, for example, by reflection, scattering, and absorption. So again, the variation in the amount of solar energy reaching allocation are caused primarily by seasonal changes in intensity of sunlight, which is determined by the angle at which the sun rays strike Earth's surface. And aside from the seasonal changes in intensity of sunlight, it is also caused uh, by the changes in the length of daylight. So that's how you see or you know the variation in uh, the amount of solar energy reaching a location in the Earth's surface. And so let's take a closer look to the Earth's orientation to the Sun. Uh, the orientation of the Earth to the Sun continually changes. Uh, that is because of the inclination of the axis and the orbit around the Sun that is called uh, the point of ecliptic. So we all know that the Earth has this imaginary axis or the imaginary line through the poles around which Earth rotates. And this axis is not perpendicular to the plane of its orbit around the sun. So the axis is not perpendicular to the plane of the ecliptic. And as what you can see in here, all the globe in four different angles, in four uh, different pictures, they are tilted to one, uh, to one and the same direction. And the axis is tilted 23 and 1 half degrees angle from the plane of the ecliptic, which is what we call uh, the inclination of axis. And if this axis were not inclined, Earth would lack seasons. But that's because uh, the axis is always pointed in the same direction towards the north, uh, the north star. So the orientation of Earth's axis to the sun's rays is constantly changing because of the inclination of the axis. Uh, for example, in the in one day, on one day in June each year, Earth's position in the orbit. Uh, take a look at the left uh, left globe. Uh, the the position of the Earth uh, is such that the northern hemisphere is inclined uh, to or leaning 23 and one half degrees angle towards the sun. And six months later, because uh, this 23 and one half degrees angle that the Earth is leaning towards the sun happens in June in each year. And six months later in December of each year, when the Earth has moved to the opposite side of its orbit, the northern hemisphere leans 
23 and one half away from the sun. So it's the opposite. And in between this opposite or the extremes, what we call the solstice, the June solstice and December solstice, the, uh, is the equinox. The equinox, uh, it happens when the lean of uh, the Earth's axis is less than 23 and one half degrees angle relative to the rays of the sun. So this change in orientation uh, causes the spot where the sun rays are vertical or uh, meaning for the sun rays are vertical where uh, the, the sun rays striking the atmosphere at the 90 degree angle it causes this spot to make an annual migration from a 23 and one half degrees north of the equator to 23 and one half degrees south of the equator and uh, the terms that you need to remember for uh, this latitude or the angles of the Earth is uh, the Arctic Circle, which is the latitude in the northern hemisphere, far north. Next is the Tropic of Cancer, just below the Arctic Circle, but above the equator. The equator is in the middle of the globe is the latitude running in the middle of the globe and below the equator is the Tropic of Capricorn the the latitude in the south in the southern hemisphere and below the Tropic of Capricorn is the Antarctic Circle so now we're gonna uh, know the characteristics of the solstices and the equinoxes. Uh, we all know that these happened because of the constant change of the orientation of the Earth's axis towards the sun rays. So on the days between the extremes, in the days between the solstice, are the equinoxes. So the lean, again, the lean of the leaning of the Earth's axis during the equinoxes is less than 23 and one half degrees angle relative to the rays of the sun. And this has made um, this change in orientation. It causes, um, it causes the the spot where the sun rays are vertical to make an annual migration from 23 and one half degrees angle north of the equator to 23 and one half degrees south of the equator. Uh, this in turn, uh, this migration causes the angle of the noon sun to vary 47 degrees for all mid latitude locations during the year so for instance uh, in one mid latitude location uh, it has a maximum noon sun angle of 73 and one half degrees when the sun's vertical rays have reached their farthest northward location in june and a minimum uh, uh, and a minimum noon sun angle of 26 and one half degrees in July, after six months later, in after June. So there is a difference of 47 degrees. And if you compare it by contrast, a city on the equator will experience an annual migration of half that amount to 23 and one half degrees now coming back to this figure we all know now that uh, there are uh, different seasons the solstice and the equinox so in the left side uh, the globe is representing or the earth is representing uh, the june solstice where the 
next one is vertical at 23 and one half degrees north latitude or 23 and one half degrees north of the Tropic of Cancer. So in this uh, position in the northern hemisphere, this is called the summer solstice. So the astronomical definition of uh, the weather or the climate, this is the first official day of summer. And on the farther right side, the opposite side of this June solstice is the, is the December solstice. Or in the Northern Hemisphere, this is the winter solstice. Again, the first official day of winter in the Northern Hemisphere is December 21st. And since this is only in the northern part, in the southern part, it should be opposite. This should be the start of the summer solstice. And in between, uh, the equinoxes occur midway between these two solstices. And for the equinoxes, we all know now that it occurs during March and September. In March, it is what we call the spring or the vernal equinox in the northern hemisphere. And of course, it is the opposite for the southern hemisphere. And in September equinox, in the northern hemisphere, it is at the fall or the autumnal equinox. And in the Southern Hemisphere, this is the spring or the vernal equinox. It's the opposite. So on these dates, the vertical rays of the sun strike at the equator or the zero degree latitude because Earth's position is such that its axis is tilted neither toward nor away from the sun. So it shows uh, that the circle of illumination, there is the shadow part here and the bright part. This, uh, that is the boundary separating the dark half of the Earth from the lighted half. And the length of the daylight is established by comparing the fraction of a line of latitude that is on the day side of the circle of illumination within the fraction on the night side. So let's say the sun's rays is coming from the center and it directs towards where the arrow is pointing, where there is the daylight and the shade where is, uh, there is the night side. And uh, for the upper uh, the upper part of the illustration, again, uh, this is the June solstice, or in the northern hemisphere, this is the summer solstice. And this explains uh, that the length of daylight is greater than the length of uh, the night light, uh, of the night. And it's opposite during uh, December or the winter solstice, it happens that the length of darkness exceeds the length of daylight. And remember, this is in the northern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, it's always the opposite of this northern hemisphere. And in this figure, it shows the daily paths of the sun. And this shows the various paths of the sun for a place located at 40 degrees north latitude at three different times of the year. So the seasonal changes in length of daylight and the sun's angle are the primary causes of the month to month variations in temperature observed at most location. In, in, in June 
21 to 22. As you can see in the first illustration, the sun is angled, uh, the sun rays is angled directly towards uh, the surface of the earth, particularly in the 40 degrees north latitude, which has caused the summer solstice for to have the longest day. And in the third illustration, during December, when the sun, the angle of the sun is coming downward, then this has the shortest day, because this is the winter sol solstice at 40 degrees north of latitude. And you just have to remember that the farther north allocation is from the equator on June 21, which is during the summer solstice of the north, that means the longer the period of daylight it will experience. And of course, it's the opposite for uh, the southern hemisphere. That means the farther the north, the longer the day, the daylight it will experience. And then during this time, on June 21st, the farther the south, the longer of um, night, nighttime period they will experience. And uh, that's why midnight sun happens. Because um, on this date, the June 21 to 22, every year, the sun does not set for a period that ranges from one day at the Arctic Circle. At the very northern part, during June 21st, the sun does not set for a day. And for about four months at the 80 degrees north latitude, it does not set for about four months. And at the pole, at the northern port, pole, it does not, the sun does not set for about six months, particularly at um, the northern pole. And in this picture, the midnight sun, it shows uh, multiple exposures taken on the same day. You can see that uh, it likes the array of sun, but it's on the same day at different time, different exposure, uh, as it appears before midnight. So uh, this image, the left portion, uh, it shows midnight sun. So, and after the midnight in the midsummer, it still, it still shows the sun is up. So, at about 80 degrees north latitude, uh, this could happen. The sun is always up. And uh, in the right part of the illustration, it shows that the path of the sun at the same location. If you notice, uh, <clears throat> The sun never sets and only gets close to the horizon at midnight. So the noon sun and the sun angle is 33 and one half degrees. And then when it goes, uh, it's rotate, uh, the earth is rotating and the midnight sun is still there at the northern part. So notice that the sun does not drop below the horizon at any time during the entire day. The Arctic Circle, which is the corresponding latitude in the southern hemisphere, the Antarctic Circle, rather, is the corresponding latitude in the southern hemisphere, it experiences uh, you know, the opposite situation, the total darkness on June 21st. So, these places located on on or north of the Arctic Circle uh, experience midnight sun during the summer solstice and in the southern hemisphere the total darkness.
during the summer solstice of the northern hemisphere. That means the winter solstice of the southern hemisphere. In this table, it shows uh, the characteristics of the solstices and equinoxes for the northern hemisphere. And again, this shows for the northern hemisphere as a review. And if you will uh, remember, what happens in the northern hemisphere is the opposite to the southern hemisphere. You will see in here uh, why a mid-latitude location is warmest in the summer when the days are longest and uh, the angle of the sun above the horizon is the highest. So near the winter solstice, uh, the reverse occurs. That means the days are shortest and the sun angle is the lowest. And during the equinoxes, meaning there is an equal day and equal night, the length of daylight is 12 hours everywhere on Earth because the circle of illumination passes directly through the poles and therefore it divides the lines of latitude in half and all locations situated at the same latitude have identical sun angles and lengths of daylight. This is just a summary of the characteristics of the solstices and equinoxes of the northern hemisphere. And in here, in this slide, it shows the climatological seasons. So we've seen the astronomical definition of the seasons. So it defines that the winter in the northern hemisphere, uh, as the period from the winter solstice is December 21 to 22, it starts from that, to the spring equinox, uh, March 21 to March 22. However, uh, this definition is um, used most widely by the news media, yet um, this is not unusual in some locations to have significant snowfalls weeks before the official start of the winter. So, that means the winter-like conditions can actually occur long before the designated first day of the winter, which is December 21, in the astronomical definition of the seasons. So, because of this, just because uh, the weather phenomena we normally associate with each season do not coincide well with the astronomical seasons, what we've seen previous, previously in the previous slides. Therefore, uh, the meteorologists, they prefer to divide uh, the annual, the year into four, three month periods, or in one year, they divide uh, quarterly, three months in four, based primarily on the temperature. So, in as much as this for three months period, uh, it better reflects the temperatures and weather that we associate with respective climatological seasons. So this definition of the seasons is more useful for meteorolo meteorological discussions. And this is better shown in this graph that in the x-axis it shows uh, the months in one year, and in the y-axis, or the vertical axis of this graph, it shows the temperature. And uh, in the horizontal axis are the months. The fluctuating temperature is um, traced by this red line, and as what you can see, the warmest is during June to August. So it does not necessarily start in June 21, as what the astronomical definition of the season is showing, but the temperature already starts to, um, to rise in June. 
So in climatological season, they call this summer starting June until August. They divide this uh, quarterly, three months for four seasons. So the spring starts from March until May, the summer starts from June to August, and fall or the autumn starts from September to November, and uh, the winter starts from December to February. And so that's all for uh, the climatological seasons. And now we're going to move on to the next um, subtopic, which is the temperature and heat transfer. And if you want to take a break at this point, you may take a 10 minute break or 15 minutes, but just make sure to come back and continue the lecture. And now there are certain terms that we need um, to review in order to understand well this topic. First is the energy. And then we have the temperature. And then we have uh, the heat. And so for the energy, this is defined as the capacity for doing work. The energy can be categorized as either kinetic energy or potential energy. So the temperature is a measure of uh, the average kinetic energy of the atoms or molecules in a substance. Why is it uh, the average of kinetic energy? Because if you go back to the definition of kinetic energy, it is uh, the energy in motion, and the potential energy is the energy at rest or just the potential to do the work. And temperature is, yeah, we know that it's used to describe how warm or cold an object is, and it is formally defined as what I've said, as the measure of the average kinetic energy of the atoms or molecules in a substance. So when a heated substance, I mean, when a substance is heated, its molecules and atoms move faster and its temperature rises. So by contrast, when an object cools, the atoms and molecules vibrate more slowly and its temperature drops. It is important, though, to note that this kinetic energy, or the temperature, is not a measure of the total kinetic energy of an object. Just because um, the molecules are measured by its movement, uh, as it moves faster, it goes up the temperature, and it cools down, and uh, the vibration of uh, the molecules and the atoms are more slowly. That's why it is says that uh, the temperature is officially the measure of uh, the average kinetic energy because kinetic energy is uh, the energy in motion, but it is not the measure of the total kinetic energy. And this kinetic energy is also um, termed as heat or thermal energy. It is common to use the word heat to describe um, a thermal energy. And this thermal energy is what we call the energy contained in a substance as a result of its temperature. So it's um, interchangeable sometimes for the heat or the thermal energy. And for the heat, it is defined as the energy transferred into or out of an object because of temperature differences between that object and its surroundings. So the heat flows from a region of higher temperature to a region of lower temperature. 
And once the temperatures become equal, heat stops flowing. And so uh, the meteorologists um, categorized heat in two. First is the latent heat, and next is the sensible heat. We will know what is latent heat and what is sensible heat. For the latent heat, it is said that it is uh, the energy required to convert a solid into a liquid or vapor, or a liquid into a vapor without a change of temperature. So it's the energy absorbed by the escaping water vapor molecule during evaporation. That's why the term uh, latent is used to describe this phenomenon because uh, the thermal energy or the heat required to evaporate the water is stored or hidden within uh, the escaping water vapor. And it shows in this graph, in this illustration, in this figure, that latent heat is either absorbed or released by each of these phase changes. For example, from solid to gas, what we call the sublimation, heat energy is absorbed from the environment and from the melting of solid to evaporation. That's another phase change. So also from, from gas to solid is what we call the deposition or the condensation if you say from gas to liquid and to freezing if you will um, if you will convert or the face of the water will change from liquid to solid. So again, um, evaporation is considered a cooling process because it removes heat from the environment. Uh, the latent heat stored in water vapor is eventually released, usually to the atmosphere, during condensation. So, so in the condensation, when water vapors returns to its liquid state during cloud formation. Uh, therefore, condensation is the opposite of the evaporation and is uh, the energy returns uh, to the environment and therefore it is considered a warming process. So when the water vapor condenses and releases heat to the atmosphere, this is referred to as the latent heat of condensation. So again, this latent heat in general is the energy that is required or that contains, that is what is in there to convert the to convert a solid into liquid or a liquid into to a vapor without a change in temperature. And next is uh, the sensible heat. Why it is called sensible heat? That is because it is uh, the heat energy we feel and this is what we measure with a thermometer. That's why it's called sensible heat because it can be sensed and like the latent heat that is hidden. Now we're going to talk about the mechanisms of heat transfer. So the mechanisms of heat transfer are conduction, convection, and radiation. I think you're all familiar with these terms, but we will define and review again what do this means. So conduction is 
uh, the molecule to molecule transfer of heat. And metals are said to be good conductors. So again, conduction is the transfer of heat through molecular collisions from one molecule to another. That's why metals are good conductors. And uh, objects that are poor conductors are actually called insulators. And for the convection, convection is heat transfer that involves the actual movement or circulation of a substance. And it takes place in fluids. Uh, for example, liquids such as water and gases such as air, where the material can flow. This is where or when the convic conviction happens. For example, um, when you're boiling a pan of water, I mean a water in a pan rather, it's heated over a campfire or over a fire. As long as the water is heated from the bottom and it cools near the top, it will continue to turn over. So producing a convec convective circulation. So because the water molecules is heated from the bottom, these water molecules um, become buoyant and it goes up. And then the cool water molecules from up goes down. So it, the, the, the pattern repeats over and over. So it continues to turn over. That's why it produces the convective circulation. And so another example is this rising warmer air and descending cooler air from, at, from the atmosphere. So the warm parcels of rising air are called thermals. As what you can see in this illustration, the convection of this type, the rising air, or the thermals, um, this, this is, uh, this not only transfers heat, but also transport moisture or the water vapor. And these increase uh, the cloudiness that can, that you can observe or frequently observe on the warm summer afternoons. Uh, if you check closely in uh, the first illustration, the heating of Earth's surface produces thermal of rising air that transport the uh, heat and moisture at the atmosphere. And then after that, in the next illustration in the B, the rising air cools and if it reaches the condensation level, the cloud forms. And then the cool air goes back down then it forms the conviction. And this atmospheric circulation consists of vertical as well as the horizontal components. So this horizontal component of airflow, for example, the wind, is termed as advection. This is used to denote the horizontal component because the vertical component uh, is what we call the convection. And the vertical component is termed as the advection. So meteorologists often use the term convection to describe the part of the atmospheric circulation that involves upward and downward motion of the air. And this advection, the example of this is the wind, the horizontal um, movement of the airflow. So aside from conduction, convection, mechanisms of heat transfer, another one is the radiation. The radiation is the only mechanism that can transfer thermal energy through the vacuum of space and thus is responsible for uh, solar energy reaching the Earth. 
the earth and let's take um, a closer observation for the solar radiation when you say solar radiation the sun is the ultimate source of energy that drives the weather machine so all the types of radiation from the sun travel through the vacuum of space at 300,000 kilometers per second. This is known, this value, 300,000 kilometers per second or 186,000 miles per second, is the value known as the speed of light. So the solar radiation or the sun emits light of varying energy, such as the visible light, infrared radiation, ultraviolet radiation. I think you have heard these terms before, and later on we will know more about them. And this example of varying energy is only part of a large array of energy called radiation or electromagnetic radiation. And in this figure, it shows the electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, the names and wavelengths of various types of electromagnetic radiation is shown in this figure in nanometers. A nanometer is 1,000 of micrometer. So, from gamma rays, which is 0 0.001 nanometers, until the radio waves to 1,000 meters of um, the wavelengths. The waves of electromagnetic radiation, it comes in various sizes or various wavelengths as what you can see. In this, uh, in this illustration, uh, the wavelength is what we call the distance from one crest to the other. If you are checking from left to right, you can see the increasing wavelengths, the increasing crest from one crest, I mean, the increasing distance from one crest to the next. And if you see or if you check from right to the left, it shows the, um, the decreasing wavelengths or the short wavelengths. But that also means the short wavelength has uh, the increasing energy. So from a gamma rays to X rays to ultraviolet, and then we have visible light uh, that for the visible light, we have different colors here that ranges from violet, the smallest wavelength, to the red color to, with 0 0.7 micrometer. So this is the bigger wavelength or the longer wavelength for the visible light. And uh, radiation is actually often identified by uh, the effect that it produces when it interacts with an object. For example, uh, the retinas of our eyes, for instance, are sensitive to the range of wavelengths. That is um, what we called the visible light. So, uh, from gamma rays is the has uh, the most energy and also has the shortest wavelength and coming to x-rays to ultraviolet and that's this ultraviolet as what we know the uv the uv rays it burns the sun it causes health issues health risk cataracts for human beings and the visible light has um Visible light also has shorter wavelengths, but a little bit 
longer compared to gamma rays, X-rays, and ultraviolet rays. The, the infrared is, has a higher wavelengths. And next to infrared is the microwave and the radio waves. So this uh, is the electromagnetic spectrum. This is what we call uh, the solar radiation. The radiation that is coming from the sun, emitted from the sun in varying energy. So again, energy from the sun is irradiated in range of wavelengths, and the shorter the wavelengths, the more energetic they are, the more energy it contains. So we're going to review the laws of radiation. So the fundamental concepts of these laws of radiation are pretty straightforward. First is all objects continually emit radiant energy over a range of wavelengths. That means the temperature of the object must be above a theoretical value called abs absolute zero, or what we call the zero degree Kelvin, or negative 273 degrees Celsius in order to emit radiant energy. So basically, you can say that all objects continually emit radiant energy over a range of wavelengths. It doesn't matter if it's hot or cold, it continually emits radiant energy. And uh, the hotter objects radiate more total energy per unit area than do colder objects. So again, uh, following the first law of radiation, all objects continually emit radiant energy. It doesn't matter if it's hot or cold, but the hotter objects, it radiates more total energy per unit area than the colder objects. And the hotter objects radiate energy in form of shorter wavelength radiation than do the cooler objects. Cooler objects, rather. So, um, as what I've mentioned previously that the shorter wavelength, the more energetic it is. So with the hotter objects, it means it has more energy, then it comes from a shorter wavelength radiation than the cooler objects. Radiation emitted by Earth is often referred to as long wave radiation because the Earth um, appears to be uh, emitting cooler uh, radiation or the long wave radiation, whereas the solar radiation is the short wave radiation. It has more energy from the sun. So it's not only the sun that emits radiation or that emits energy, but also the earth. But when you compare both the earth and the sun, the sun emits the short wavelength and the earth emits the long wave radiation. And the fourth law that says objects that are good absorbers of radiations are also good emitters. So bodies that absorb and radiate all wavelengths well are cold block bodies. So, um, objects that are good absorbers of radiation, such as the Earth surface. Since the Earth is a good absorber of radiation from the Sun, it, that means it is also good emitters of radiation. By contrast, the gases that compose our atmosphere are selective absorbers and emitters of radiation. So if the earth is a good absorber and good emitter, the gases that you can find in our earth's atmosphere are actually not good uh, absorbers and good emitters. They are selective absorbers and selective emitters of radiation. 
And most atmospheric gases are good absorbers of radiation only in certain wavelengths. But others are poor absorbers in other wavelengths. That means they are selective. And to come to the question, what happens to the incoming solar radiation? What happens to the radiation distributed by the sun towards the Earth? So we have the process of transmission, absorption, or reflection, or scattering. Because it has been said that solar radiation may be transmitted, absorbed, or reflected and scattered once it reaches the atmosphere. It all depends greatly upon the wavelength of the radiation. Remember that the radiation has wavelengths, the short and the long wavelengths. And it depends on that whether it has the short or long wavelength, then it depends if it's transmitted or absorbed or reflected or scattered. And also it depends as well as the size and nature of the intervening material, whether it's absorbed by that material or it's scattered or where uh, the solar radiation is accepted or received or reflected. And to go to these uh, each of the process, for example, transmission and absorption. What you can see in here is the average distribution of incoming solar radiation. So the incoming solar radiation, let's say 100%, 20% of radiation is absorbed by the atmosphere and clouds, and then 50% is um, directed and diffused radiation absorbed by the land and sea. So that accounts for 70%. And actually, the 30% remaining is lost to space by reflection and scattering. So the transmission process is officially defined by which energy passes through the atmos atmosphere or any transparent media without interacting with the gases or other particles in the atmosphere. Just directly transmit the energy through the atmosphere without any interaction of the gases or other particles. And the absorption is, let's say, we all know what is absorption. It's absorbed. It's not just transmitted, but absorbed. So the amount of energy absorbed by an object depends on the wavelength of the radiation and the, obs on the object's absorptivity. So again, it depends on the wavelength of the radiation, whether it's short wave or the long wave radiation. And it also depends on the object that absorbs, the capacity of the object to absorb. For example, for example, the snow. The snow is another example of a selective absorber. A selective absorber, absorber, that means it's not a good absorber, but it only selects what it can absorb. Because snow is a poor absorber of visible light. So if you remember, the range of radiation, we have ultraviolet and we have visible, we have visible light. The snow is a poor absorber of um, visible light because it reflects 90% of this and it does not absorb. But snow is a very good absorber of long wave infrared radiation that it absorbs up to 95% of the infrared radiation that is emitted uh, from the Earth's surface. So again, you see 
the absorption, it depends on the wavelength of the radiation and the object's absorptivity. Because some objects are selective absorber, it depends on the wavelength, if they accept it or not. And although Earth's surface is um, a relatively good absorber, that means effectively, effectively absorbing most wavelengths of solar radiation, the atmosphere is not. I've mentioned that the Earth is a good absorber, absorber, but the atmosphere is a selective absorber because of its gases. And therefore, more solar energy is absorbed by Earth's surface than by the Earth's atmosphere. So, from uh, the radiation that were emitted by the sun, more of these are absorbed by the Earth's surface than by absorbed by the atmosphere, as what you can uh, see in this uh, figure. So, as the result, as a result, gases in the atmosphere absorb only twenty percent of the solar radi radiation that reaches the earth and as mentioned aside from being transmitted or, or absorbed the radiation the solar radiation could also be reflected and scattered and by definition reflection is the process whereby light bounces back from an object at about the same angle and intensity at which it was received. And by this reflection, the fraction of radiation that is reflected by an object is what we call albedo. And in this figure, in this illustration or in this picture, it shows the reflection and the albedo the albedo reflectivity of various surfaces. And it seems like the light-colored surfaces tend to be more reflective than dark-colored surfaces and thus have higher albedos. And the total albedo of the Earth, Earth's total albedo, is called planetary albedo. And that uh, is 30%. Uh, thick clouds... Is what you can see in there that 70 to 90 percent which have high albedos are responsible for most of earth's brightness as seen from space and in another uh, fraction of radiation that is reflected by others for example the thick clouds it accounts for 25 to 30 percent and also, the grass, 5 to 25 percent. The light roof, 35 to 50 percent. So it depends on, on the color of the object. So, aside from the color, it, um, it also depends on the object's capacity to reflect. And for the scattering, it is... A general process in which radiation bounces off an obstacle in many direction. So um, this is the scattering by atmospheric particles. So when the sunlight is scattered, the rays travel in different directions as what you can see in this picture. So usually more energy is scattered in the forward direction than is backscattered. So more likely you can see forward direction that, than uh, backscattered. Um, however, uh, there is what we call the diffuse light. Uh, scattered energy in different directions. This results to the diffuse light. 
because although incoming solar radiation travels in a straight line, the small dust particles and gas molecules in the atmosphere scatter some of these energy in different directions. So this is called diffuse light when it's scattered in different directions. And overall, about one half of the solar radiation that is uh, absorbed at Earth's surface, it arrives as a diffused light or scattering light. And apparently, the scattering that, we, that we've known, there is a selective scattering by gas molecules in Earth's atmosphere that this produces uh, the blue skies and red sunsets. So, um, scattering of visible light by atmospheric gases is what we call the Rayleigh scattering. And as what you can see in this, in here, uh, the, there's a midday sun. The midday sun, uh, the observer, as you, if you are the observer, it's, you see a sun that is whitish or, and the blue sky. And in the sunset, we normally see, as the observer, a reddish sunset. That means that is because short wavelengths, if you remember, the short wavelengths, the visible light, the shorter wavelengths of visible light is colored blue and violet. So they are scattered more effectively than longer wavelengths. So therefore, when the sun is overhead during the midday, an observer can look in any direction and see predominantly blue light that was selectively scattered. And this selectively scattered is uh, responsible by the gas molecules in the atmosphere. So uh, that is for the midday sun. And in contrast, if you compare it to the sunset, as what you can see in the picture, it's a bit reddish. The, that's because at sunset, the path that light must take through the atmosphere is much longer. If you can see that the path of the light has to go through is much longer compared to the midday sun that it's striking direct. The sun is overhead just above and it can strike direct. And in the during the sunset, the angle of the sun uh, is different and then the sun rays is affected. It has a different angle. And the path that light must take through at the atmosphere is much longer. And that means uh, most of this blue light the blue light, the short wavelength of the visible light, is they're already scattered away even before it reaches. It reaches us, it reaches in our sight. So therefore, the remaining that we can see, the remaining color that we can see, it appears as reddish in color for the sun. And uh, another scattering of visible light is not just by atmospheric gases, but also by dust or smoke. And that is called the maze scattering. So example of this maze scattering is when large quantities of um, tiny dust or smoke particles that penetrate the stratosphere, for example, through the eruption of a volcano from a long time ago, if I'm not mistaken, in Indonesia, let's say, a brilliant sunset because of this eruption of the volcano, because of this dust and smoke, the, the visible light scattered by this dust and smoke of this volcano. 
and there's a brilliant sunset that occurred worldwide and that makes even the summer cooler than um, than the normal so uh, this means that the May scattering is responsible for it uh, it has been attributed to the loss of incoming solar radiation due to an increase in back scattering and another thing that we need to know is what we call the crepuscular rays so the scattering of visible light by the atmospheric gases there is scattering of visible light by the dust or smoke there's also the scattering of light by haze water droplets or dust particles it makes possible for us this may uh, it makes possible for us to see the crepuscular rays so it's the bands or rays of sunlight that looks like this as in the picture so crepuscular rays um, is produced when sun shines through a break in the clouds and the haze scatters the light therefore the rays appears like that in the picture the color of the sky all of these examples means that the color of the sky gives an indication of the size of particles present uh, the numerous small particles produce red sunset whereas um, the large the large particles they produce the white gray skies so that means the bluer the sky the less polluted the air is in the atmosphere and now we will see uh, the role of gases in the atmosphere i think we've mentioned or i've mentioned uh, that these gases helped heating of the atmosphere uh, this is what we call the greenhouse gases it helps heating up the atmosphere and it is shown in this figure the absorption of solar and terrestrial radiation by gases in the atmosphere but when i said terrestrial radiation uh, it means uh, the radiation coming from the earth so as what you can see in this side the a this all of uh, this represents the incoming shortwave radiation from the sun uh, this is shown by the arrow downwards the yellow arrow down, downwards and and the right side with this uh, which is the b uh, illustration this is the outgoing low long wave radiation from the earth represented by shown by the arrow uh, towards uh, towards up uh, the pink arrow and in, in the bottom the horizontal axis this where you can see uh, the measurement of the wavelength represented in micrometers and that also represents the different radiation for example the lower or the shorter wavelength is we have the ultraviolet and then we have uh, towards the right side the visible radiation and then the infrared radiation with uh, the longer wavelength and in the y-axis or the vertical axis we have the absorptivity and we have four different layers here first is at total atmosphere and then we have the water vapor and we have uh, the carbon dioxide and the oxygen and ozone so these are uh, the gases and we will um, check the role for of these gases in the atmosphere with regards to the absorption of this light or I mean of this radiation the incoming or the outgoing radiation so this graph actually depicts the effectiveness of the selected gases of the atmosphere 
in absorbing incoming shortwave radiation. So the shortwave radiation, again, is in the left side. This is, when you say shortwave radiation, this is the radiation coming from the sun. And the outgoing longwave radiation, or the terrestrial radiation, is the radiation coming from the Earth. It's in the right side. So in the blue areas here, these represent the percentage of radiation absorbed. So all of these fluctuating like wave in blue or sky blue color, this is a percentage of absorption by the various gases in each um, level or in each layer that is represented in this graph. So if you observe in this graph, especially the graph A, the atmosphere as a whole is a quite transparent the visible radiation. You can see the visible radiation here. It's represented like a rainbow from blue to red color, blue, green, yellow, and red color. Why I, why did I say that uh, the atmosphere is transparent to this visible radiation? Because this visible light reaches to the ground, is what you can see. It, it doesn't absorb, there is no absorption. It just passed through, transmitted to the ground. So that means that the atmosphere is actually a poor absorber of visible radiation. Most of this energy is transmitted to the Earth's surface. So we say that um, the atmosphere is nearly transparent to incoming solar radiation. Therefore, solar energy is not an effective heater of the Earth's atmosphere. So if uh, the atmosphere is being heated, it's not because, well, it's not mainly because of the solar energy, because the atmosphere does not absorb the energy. It just mostly passes through the, the visible radiation it passes to the ground, it only well absorbs the ultraviolet a little, the short wave energy, I mean the short wave radiation a little, but not most part of the radiation, the incoming short wave radiation, which is the visible light. However, the atmosphere, what we can say, is generally relatively efficient absorber of long wave radiation that is emitted by the Earth. If you can see in this graph B, in the second graph, there are more absorption that happens in here, in this blue represented by sky blue color. So although some of this long wave radiation, this one is in the infrared, infrared long wave radiation, it escapes through the atmospheric window. It escapes through, this is the atmospheric window where uh, the atmosphere does not absorb the infrared radiation. But however, you can still see that mostly, most of this radiation is absorbed by the atmosphere. So the atmospheric window is important because it allows long wave radiation from the Earth surface to pass directly to the space without being absorbed. However, in times or in the situations where there is clouds, where there are clouds, if you could if you would compare, clouds are composed of tiny uh, tiny droplets. So uh, these clouds are excellent absorbers of energy in the atmospheric window. So if the atmospheric window allows this infrared radiation to just go through the space without getting absorbed in the atmosphere, the clouds could absorb outgoing long wave radiation and radiate much of this energy back to the Earth's surface. So therefore, the clouds serve a purpose similar to a window blind because window blinds because 
they effectively, the clouds effectively block the atmospheric window. And therefore, it lowers the rate at which the Earth's surface cools. Because the atmospheric window allows this infrared or the long wave radiation to go to the space. However, when there are clouds, it, this is blocked by the clouds and the clouds absorb this long wave radiation. And then instead of, remember that this radiation is, uh, is heat, like the, the hotter, uh, the hotter it will become, the Earth's surface, the hotter it will become if it's trapped by the clouds. So, this explains why nighttime temperatures remain higher on cloudy nights. If there are many clouds, therefore, it absorbs more of this uh, long wave radiation. So, the temperatures remain higher on cloudy nights than on clear nights because the atmosphere is largely transparent to to the short wave radiation but more absorptive of the long wave radiation that is coming from the earth so the atmosphere is actually heated from the ground up and not from up to the atmosphere not from the sun towards the atmosphere but the atmosphere is actually heated from the radiation from the ground so this generally explains the drop in temperature during um, for example when increase in altitude in the troposphere because the heat is actually coming from the ground up so the farther from the radiator or the earth's surface then the colder it gets i hope you do understand this concept and the fact that the atmosphere does not acquire the bulk of its energy directly from the sun but is heated by the earth's surface is of utmost importance to the dynamics of the weather. So we've known the greenhouse gases and how it absorbs the radiation and could cause the warming or the heating up of the atmosphere. So we will define the greenhouse effect. Actually, the greenhouse effect is a natural phenomenon that warms the surface and lower atmosphere, making Earth habitable. So, it's a natural phenomenon that starts because of, uh, for example, from the clear skies are largely transparent to incoming shortwave solar radiation, right? So, it does not absorb the short wave radiation, the solar radiation. And then it transmits much of the short wave radiation to the Earth's surface. So from this radiation that was transmitted, because the, the, the atmosphere is transparent, the radiation coming from the sun, it passed through the atmosphere and it transmits this short wave radiation towards the Earth's surface. And this radiation is absorbed at the surface and eventually re radiated skyward as long wave terrestrial radiation. So, from this transmitted um, radiation, absorbed radiation from the Earth's surface, the Earth will then radiate it back upwards as a long wave radiation. And the water vapor and the carbon dioxide, which are called the greenhouse gases, absorb this significant portion of long wave radiation that is re radiated by the Earth, that is radiated or emitted by the Earth's surface 
toward the atmosphere. So since these greenhouse gases, the water vapor and the carbon dioxide absorbed the significant portion of long wave radiation, it increases the temperature of the atmosphere. And then the atmosphere in turn radiates some of this energy out to space, but most importantly, it radiates an equivalent amount back toward the Earth's surface. That's why it heats up the environment of the Earth. This process or this phenomenon is what we call the greenhouse effect. And there is a confusion for some people, I think, between the greenhouse effect and the global warming. But you have to remember that the greenhouse effect and global warming are different concepts. Because the greenhouse effect is a natural phenomenon. Without the greenhouse effect, Earth would be uninhabitable. So, uh, the scientists or the researchers have mounting evidence that the human activities, particularly the release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, are responsible for a rise in global temperatures. That's the global warming. So, therefore, humans are the compounding effects of an otherwise natural process which is what we call the greenhouse effect so greenhouse effect is not actually a bad thing but it's a natural phenomenon but due to human activities we keep releasing the carbon dioxide and then it has intensified the effect of the greenhouse it has intensified the greenhouse effect and causes the global warming. So it is incorrect to equate the greenhouse phenomenon, uh, which makes life possible with global warming. Because greenhouse is a phenomenon that makes life possible. And uh, the global warming, which involves undesirable changes to our atmosphere, this is caused mainly by human activities. So now after all of this discussion of the greenhouse effect, the warming of the Earth's atmosphere, now we will check the Earth's energy budget. So when you say the Earth's energy budget, it is uh, the surface to atmosphere equilibrium. So the energy budget from the surface to the atmosphere is always reaching an equilibrium that is achieved through conduction, convection, the transfer of latent heat, and the transmission of long wave radiation between the Earth's surface and the atmosphere. So this is what we've known today, with today's discussion. So the Earth's average temperature remains relatively constant despite seasonal cold spells and heat waves. And this um, stability indicates that a balance exists between the amount of incoming solar radiation and the amount of um, radiation emitted back to um, emitted back to space. So otherwise Earth would be getting progressively colder or warmer if there is no equilibrium. And this Earth's energy budget, actually, we have the annual energy budget. By definition, 
is the annual balance or the yearly balance of incoming and outgoing radiation as well as the energy balance that exists between the Earth's surface and its atmosphere. So it's better illustrated in this figure. For example, since we are talking about there is a balance actually of the incoming and the outgoing. So the incoming solar radiation, as what you can see in this, let's say it's 100 units. And this one, from this 100 units, since we say that the atmosphere is transparent of the visible light of the shortwave radiation, 50% or mostly, that's 50%, is directed or transmitted and absorbed by the Earth's surface. So only 50%. And the rest, for example, the 20% of the solar radiation is absorbed by the atmosphere and the clouds. And the 30% actually is reflected and scattered back to the space. So that makes it 100%, right? And out of this 50% that is absorbed by the Earth's surface, 7%, like 7 units of this, is lost from Earth's surface by conduction and convection. So it goes up again, the seven units goes up to, this, to the atmosphere by conduction and convection. And it's the seven units, for, we also have the 23 units out of this 50 lost by evaporation from the Earth's surface through latent heat this it goes back up again to the atmosphere so from condensation latent heat and then that makes 23 and 7 units then that makes 30 units and the last 20 units from this 50 units that is absorbed by the earth's surface is actually lost by long wave radiation from the earth's surface so for this 20, 12% is emitted through the space and 8 is gained by the atmosphere. So all of this 50 units that is absorbed by the Earth's surface is eventually just being redirected back or emitted to the space by the atmosphere and then the process is just the same that's why there is balance and so the quantity of incoming solar radiation is like eventually over time is balanced by the quantity of long wave radiation that is radiated back to the space so that's uh, the Earth's energy budget. That's why there is a constant average temperature in the Earth. And we will also check the latitudinal energy budget. Because even if we say that there is a balance of incoming and outgoing radiation, uh, that is, we are speaking over for the entire planet, but actually it is not maintained at each latitude. So the zone that spawns the equator receives more solar radiation than what is lost to space. And the higher latitudes where more heat is lost through radiation, emitted by Earth than is received from the sun. So the higher latitudes where there are more heat is lost through radiation emitted by the Earth, uh, there are, that's more heat lost and lesser heat received from the sun in higher latitudes. And this is 
how it is represented by a radiation map showing the imbalance of incoming solar radiation and outgoing terrestrial radiation for a typical year. And in effect, the energy imbalance actually drives the wind and the ocean currents, but that will be discussed in the later topics, in the later lectures. So, if in general, the entire Earth has the balance of incoming and outgoing radiation, but actually, the balance is just in the center, but if you check in each latitude, there is an imbalance. Net deficit in the polar regions and net surplus in this equator zone. So this latitudinal heat, uh, this, uh, this latitudinal heat is shown, the balance is shown here at the average over an entire year. So the global wind system, and to a lesser extent, the ocean acts as giant thermal engines, transferring surplus heat from the tropics to poleward. So this is where uh, the oceans come in to balance the imbalance of the, the energy in each latitude. And we will talk about them more on uh, the, other, the other lectures of later on. So, in summary, let's uh, wrap this up. First, first point we need to remember is that the weather is the result of the interactions of solar radiation with Earth's atmosphere and its land sea surface. And the seasonal changes in length of daylight and the sun's angle are the primary causes of the month to month variations in temperature observed at most locations. Also, we need to remember that energy can be categorized as either kinetic energy or potential energy, and the sun is the ultimate source of energy that drives the weather machine. So, the greenhouse effect is a natural phenomenon that warms the surface and the lower atmosphere of the Earth. So the average temperature of the Earth remains relatively constant. And these points we have to remember as the summary for our overall lecture for today. I hope you get some lessons or some points for today. And thank you so much for your attention and for listening.